I'm speaking today with Carl Crawford, who is the owner and founder of Sail Exchange, which was developed to repurpose racing and cruising sails, giving boat owners a fresh source of affordable sails with plenty of life left in them. Sail Exchange can match rigs with their thousand plus inventory of sailors to provide boat owners with an affordable sail to purchase. So Carl, first of all, can you tell me a bit about your background in sailing? Yeah, well, my background started when I was about eight or nine years old. My father was sailing, so I grew up in a sailing family. And in those days, your father wasn't around there. They left on Friday, came back on Sunday. So I used to go down to the sailing club on the bus at Mill Harbour where my kid's sailing right now. And we started sailing in boats called Manly Juniors. They're like a little bit bigger than an optimist and they had a, a jib and a speaker. So they're quite complicated little boats. And I was nine years old. I remember being quite windy and being quite scared when I was young. And then sort of when you grew into the John Spencer design boats, we had boats called Flying Ants and Cherubs for all plywood built boats. And we used to make, get involved with making the masts and doing the work in the winter in the days when we used to, used to actually build stuff. And we raced those things quite competitively in, in the state and national championships. And then we had world championships in the Cherub. So the Spencer designs were sort of like the 29 and 49 sort of thing in those, this is back in obviously early 70s and Ian Murray got involved with a few different designs and the boat sort of took off. So grew up in a plywood era with Dacron sails and tin masts and uh, that's how it was, but we used to actually just put those things together. So that was a lot of fun. So you were very hands-on in your sailing from word go. Yeah, well, you know, as you well know, it's all changed because now you buy a boat that comes in a box and it's got instructions, you know, assemble it like a, you know, a product. But in those days, you had to go find all the bits and pieces and actually assemble it yourself because you couldn't buy a boat that was built. And you'd have some craftsmen and good shipwrights that could build plywood boats and they were, you know, beautiful things to see put together. And you're involved with that and you're involved with getting the masks and the pop rivets and the fittings from the shop and the rigging wire and swages. And you learned all those trades that are pretty much gone these days. I my kids lucky to use a screwdriver, but you know, you had to actually be able to put all those things together and it just seemed sort of normal and natural in those days. There was no other way of doing it. And that sort of grew into the skiff sailing. So we sailed skiffs and that was what you sailed in Australia. We didn't have, like the US guys had like the brand names like Connor and Durgan and Robbie Dorr. Those guys all grew up in university sailing or collegiate sailing or you know, with compasses and tactical sailing. And, we didn't even have a compass on the boat. We didn't even know what a compass was. So the most important thing was skiff sailing all through my teenage years is you got through the day without capsizing. The most important thing is the windier it got, the faster you could go and you got a chance of winning the race. Whereas if you had a bad windward beat and you were a long way further behind the other boat than last time, you didn't really know why that was because we didn't talk about lifts or headers or we didn't really know. We didn't, we didn't have coaches. None of that stuff existed. So all that mattered was getting out, getting on the racetrack, finishing the race without capsizing and you'd probably win the race if it was 25 knots and you'd win. So it was all about boat handling and that's sort of really the DNA of guys like Murray and Outridge and Slingsby, all these guys sail skips and that's the sailing that we did. So it was all about hands on and going fast and still today that's the Australian sort of DNA, you know. Well, it certainly be, seemed to be successful so who can argue with that? Yeah. Now with your business, um, before you started Sail Exchange, what were you involved in? Yeah, that's a good question. I've been involved with a lot of things over the years. So I, I, I was born in 1960, started sailing in 68, 69, so I was obviously eight or nine years old. And then in 1976, I was a very famous Australian skiff sailor and the Austin called Hugh Trahan had a small sail making business. And I was sailing at Middle Harbour where, I, where my boat is now and my kids sail. And, um, Got to know him and through a contact, basically through my father, who decided I needed to leave school, I um, got an apprenticeship in those days. So I did four years from 1976 to, to 1980. And in the 1980, Huey put me on an Admiral's Cup contending yacht. You know, I, was, I went from Nowheresville to sailing the yachts with Hugh. And Hugh helped me through the sail making career. I did my best at that, learned a few things. Again, it was hands on. And you did, obviously did a lot of sailing. And in those days, you sailed because that's what you did. So you sailed on the weekends, you sailed on the, after work, the twilight racing, all that sort of stuff that you, you know, was taken for granted. It was, just a, it was just a lifestyle and you went sailing. So 
I was lucky to do that. And I started with Huey. I did the, we had a boat called Inch by Winch. It was a Peterson 44. And we, I did my first Hobart in 980, so I was 20. And it blew 4,000 knots and was soaking wet and didn't have any good clothing and arrived in Hobart pretty shattered. But Huey was a great master and, 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 a, and, a, and a great teacher and a very patient man. And as you know, you know, the, one of the America's Cup is a tactician in Australia too. He's just a, a very underrated, but just a super nice guy. And he taught me a lot. And then um, I got into the yacht thing and then the, two years later, I ended up on a boat called Apollo it was being built, well, actually the next year in 81, owned by Jack Rooklyn. And he owned Ballyhoo and the other Apollo. And I got on board as the boat boy, you know. So I was 21 years old. The next big thing I knew is Jack came down and said, we're taking the boat to a Y. The thing was half finished, but we had to finish this built, half built boat that Sid Fisher built. It's a long story, but it was quite a crazy day. So it was 1982. So we took the boat. We actually sailed on its own bottom to a Y and back. It took six months to do a, you know, a three-week regatta. And um, it was my sort of introduction to going to sea. And I'll never forget, this is part of the story I really love, is that Stan Darling was the navigator on the boat. And I didn't really know who Stan was, but I quickly learned who he was. And we had the first Magnavox sat-nav um, fitted the boat. So I cracked a deal with him and I went and got a sextant. I sold my car and got a sextant, so he knew, he knew I was involved. And so we cracked a deal where we'd have paper charts. I'd navigate with a sextant from my HO tables, 249, all that jazz. And he had this Magnavox sat-nav. The thing was as big as like two shoe boxes. And it got like one fix every four hours out of a red and an orange and a green light. So we set off to go to New Zealand, Tahiti, Hawaii, then we came back through American Samoa, Fiji, New Caledonia. It was an amazing trip. I was 22, uh, 21, 22 years old. So never thought that was going to come up on my radar. And then I had six months with Stan as a captive audience. So I did uh, start with local apparent noon sites because you've got to remember in the 980 Hobart, which we just completed uh, in 81, we didn't have GPS or we didn't have Loran and we didn't have SatNav. So it was all done by celestial navigation. And Sidey Hammond, another famous name who was on the boat, uh, I used to take the time spot when he was navigating going to Hobart. So I was sort of in awe of this whole navigation thing. So when I got my chance to stand, I ended up doing, you know, morning and uh, LANs in the noon, high noon and then uh, evening sites. And I, was terrible at it, but I got better after six months. I could actually match where the sat nav was saying with a little cocked hat. But one thing I've got to tell you that it reminds me always of Stan is what I saw him do with weather routing, which is pretty amazing stuff. Where the guy, he was born in 1906, he was brought up in the University of Tasmania, he did acoustics at the ABC. During the war, he got sent to the Atlantic Ocean to, with uh, Morse and uh, semaphore and, and um, sonar to hunt for U-boats. Not only did the navigation of the ship, not only did he actually do the rat weather routing of the ship, but he was also trying to find these U-boats in the war. An amazing guy. Like skill sets that we, none of us have today. And I got on this boat on Apollo and he's, is it, he's put this tracing paper on a chart, huge, you know, admiralty chart. And he's sitting there with his headphones in Morse drawing a synoptic situation on a chart, right? And I was just, you know, I'm like, this is like the guy just invented fire. I could not believe what I was watching, right? And he would draw a synoptic chart and he'd draw a line in front of where the boat was and he'd say, go tell those guys that they're the steer arena, 075. Yeah, okay, right. On. Now we sailed the whole way to Hawaii and back. We never pulled the heads along. We never went on the wind. And that was, you know, is weather route. Now today we use expedition and all those other jazz and we run out in our rooms every five minutes and group files. But this guy could actually do it. He was doing this during the Second World War and he could do it on yachts and he, you know, he won five Hobarts as a navigator. And I've won four as a navigator and I want to try and beat his record. He's no longer around, but he taught me how to navigate and along the side he hammered. So I've been pretty fortunate in the sailing and in the navigation stakes, learning from some pretty special people. And um, I'm going to keep going to Hobart, but I've got to do a few more to try and beat 
um, will match Stan's record, I reckon. So that was my sailing adventure when I was young in the 20s. Then I ended up, I went to Kauai, I saw these maxi boats like Wimber Passage and Kealoa, and I was like, this is a whole new world, right? I'm 22 years old. So I brought Apollo back, sold everything I've got, got a plane ticket, which cost twice as much as they cost today, and I flew all the way to Hilton Head and started Gary Wheatley's house, another brand name. He ran a lot of Turner's boats, two Turner's boats. He got me on Wimber Passage because he sailed my father on Asta. That's another long story. So I've turned up, and Richie Boyd, another brand name, he was the run of the boat, and I've gone to Newport to get on this you know, American Max about women passage, like the biggest thing is a sliced bread. So I was there for the cup summer in 83, and I knew a lot of the guys, obviously the guys on the, the cup boat. And then we took off and went to Europe in a gale across the North Atlantic. That's another story. So I ended up on the maxi scene. So to answer your question with a yachting career, I ended up sailing on women passage, and then I got on Kieloa 3, and then Kieloa 4, and Matador, and all these boats that you know was in the 80s were just a great time to go yachting because it was before everybody packed up you know planes went on uh, sorry boats went on ships and it, we used to sail these things everywhere so we did like 14 Atlantics so you're always delivering the boat sailing getting ready for regatta so it was all about the preparation so the sail making the rigging that was my skill set so I did a lot of that until I was in my 90s and then I I was uh it's a funny story. I was actually doing some work for Harkin in 88 in Newport, Rhode Island. And then I found out that Olaf Harkin was looking for a new distributor in Australia. So I, I had a crack at doing that. I wrote Olaf a letter. In fact, in those days, it was a fax. And I remember him writing back to me saying, well, where's your business plan? I said, I don't know. What's a business plan? I had no idea. So I went to the library and read a book and developed a business plan. In those days, we had a Lotus, you know, it was like a spreadsheet, just spreadsheets and sent them a document anyway i got the gig so i got this harkin distribution in australia which was a pretty big deal for me and i ran that for till 2005 so i got involved with distribution obviously marine hardware harkin being the biggest and the best in the world and then in 2005 a guy i met sailing peter o'connell was running luma ended up um jumping ship and joining him because we were going to try and move that business somewhere else Anyway, that didn't work out because all of a sudden the GFC hit and the whole thing went uh, sideways and that plan turned to dust. So I sort of ended up back in the sail making career, which is my skill when I was an apprentice when I was 16. So I joined up with Ed Reynolds and the Quantum guys trying to build a franchise model down here. We put uh, lots all around Australia and we did a pretty good job. And then um, we got canned with a dollar there, that got hurt. And then the next thing I know, I was playing around the sail industry again it's like uh, now 2015, so five years ago. And uh, I was working with my wife and I'm thinking, you know, there's all these used sails and all these sails hanging around that Quantum Racing would use a sail for a couple of hours and I'd buy it and ship it over. And then I'd sell it to somebody here for three times I could make making a sail or building a new sail. So I thought there's something in this. So next thing I know, I ended up getting a container of sails from Wild Oats from the when that rig fell down in Europe and they put a bigger rig in it, so there's all these brand new sales. So we ended up with these sales from TPs, and ended up with sales, sourcing sales from Wild Oats. So then we started this business, and interesting enough, it wasn't a bricks and mortar business where you add a website to it. We actually had to start the business with a website because we didn't actually have a business. We just started it as an online business. Next thing I know, after six months of hard yards, we've ended up with all these people consigning sales. There's more stock coming in than going out, but we didn't have to buy it. That's a good thing. We have no debtors. We had no inventory debt. We're going to accrue any liabilities in the balance sheet. And all of a sudden, we're up to like 2,000, you know, we're up to now, we're up to about 2,500 sales. So we've got plenty of inventory. And with a dollar around the 60s, you know, we look pretty attractive selling the sales overseas so we've got sales coming in we you know we measure them i'll go through the detail later on but then we end up selling them overseas so that's where we ended up today with sale exchange and that says you in a few other businesses so there you go that's the brief part of it <laughs> well, that's a fascinating story but what is key is it is clear that the way you have grown up in the industry and with your own sailing has been hands-on first of all but secondly you've had some incredible mentors who have shown you what can be done and 
even as technology has evolved, has have shown you the basic principles that underpin everything. For example, Stan doing in his head what nowadays the computers are doing, but it shows you the true principles behind it. And the same with your rigging, where you learnt everything as a kid, but then you know everything from basic principles through to the advanced gear. Would, would you say that is the underpinning of your education, really? Well, that is my education. That's just that simple. You know, my kids gonna go to my kids going to university, but I didn't have that luxury because my father said, you know, you get a job as a sail maker, and I went, that sounds great, because I didn't know the difference. But uh, what you're saying is correct, Mark. I mean, a hundred percent, you know, you grow up with the skills and you've got to make a dollar out of it, and that's what I've done. And it does underpin it because you actually know what's right and what's wrong. And you don't need to read something that tells you what the label says. You can look at it and touch it and feel it. You sort of intuitively know if that's going to work or not work and that really helps with customers because you can actually explain to a customer the feature and the benefit from the heart you're not actually just making something up on the back of a packet so that's what i enjoy about it and, and it is hands-on but look you know you're in the same game as me and we're probably, probably watching this is that you know it's a, it's a great lifestyle industry where we're actually very lucky it's not like yeah. it's a bad industry to be in um, what is hard is just to make a lot of money out of it. A lot of people struggle with that. But it is a great lifestyle and I, I've been very fortunate and, and I have learned some, some really, really smart people. The, you know, the word intuitive gets used a lot, but people like Hugh Trahan, you know, Richard Hammond, you know, Stan Down, these guys I mentioned, they were complete seat of the pants sailors. Like, could you imagine a guy like Saudi? You know, Richard Hammond in the Admiral's Cup in the 70s, navigating ragamuffin, for example. No, and nothing but celestial navigation and RDF and a few other things. I mean, to find marks in the fog in Sherberg and all this stuff, these, these stories that end up, and they, they had no clue where they were. And they would win races. You know, Australia won the, you know. And then you look at Stan Darling, he won five Hobart races. It's unheard of. The reason why he won is he's the only one that knew where he was and what the weather was doing. Everyone else was just sort of like sailing around, you know, think, hoping they're going to get south and get to Hobart. And he was actually, you know, measuring the temperature of the water, working out the set, doing his met work, you know, on the more doing his synoptic charts. And and you know, he would go from shift to shift to shift like we try and do. And he was doing that. And they, they didn't win by minutes; they won by days. You know, and, and that's that's a skill set. And that's the people he's sailing against didn't have those skills. And I, I've been incredibly lucky because I've learned from those guys. And so when I run an algorithm and expedition and people are talking about all these grid files and all this jazz, you know, have the basics of the understanding of what you're trying to do is from the old school. And these modern tools just help us do it quickly and easily. So I've been very fortunate with navigation that way and, and probably so much with business as well because the guys like you, Trahan, I mean, he's a seat of the pants. So I make it has had a, had a, a flair and a skill and you know he could make boats go fast he could make fast sails and he was way ahead of his time really you know he won the 18th footers in 1969 built his own sail making business one was sit on stormy petrol won the one time world in the boat that wasn't a great boat uh and all the stories go on and on but i've been very lucky with those guys so some quite that. incredible mentors there um Sale Exchange, you've described really as you had to build the web platform first and then everything that was behind the scenes was literally just inventory. Um, what is the biggest hurdle you've had to overcome with the business? Well, I guess the biggest hurdle is actually making it successful because there's a lot of people that have startups that aren't successful. Now, I don't know the stats today, but I know it's a pretty high ratio of failures to success. Now, this doesn't come without hard work. And my wife, Patera, and I have been working pretty hard, like most people do in small businesses. There's no doubt about that. But what is different about it is it's actually quite unique, like no one else is doing it. And that's really why I did it, because I thought, you know, the sound making business, it's not hard to figure out a lot of competition out there. And there's a lot of good brands out there. And it's hard to compete in that space. But the avenue that we chose was to go with no competition. And what we've done is we've turned all our foes into friends so when you're a sound maker or a rigger you you know it's, it's you versus the rest of the world right you're, you know everyone's up against each other but what we've done we've turned around the other way we've now have all the sound makers consign their sales with us and we're like a 
a wholesale division or a second tier division like you have in, in most you know, mature industries like automobiles or white goods, it's all been done before, but not in sail making, especially not in marine equipment. So what's, what I've found interesting is that we've got those guys coming to us now to dispose of sales for them and their clients. And at the same time, we farm work out to them for the recuts and adjustments that we need. So it works quite well hand in hand. Everybody's happy, everyone gets along. Uh, and we've, we've been building on that, and that's been quite unique. And then we've also segued into spars. So we've got spar exchange now. We've got about, I don't know, a couple of dozen masts. Now, you've got to remember in this industry that a lot of these things laying around the boat yards are worth you know, tens of thousands of dollars, and they've just been disposed yeah. of. So we, we're working in a marketplace and a pie, which is a lot bigger pie than a lot more people without money than with money. And the people without money own boats, let me tell you. And they come to our place every day and they want to negotiate some deal on something that we've got that they've seen on our website. And you know, I'm, I'm always saying, look, the price on the website is pretty simple, but the people that need this equipment can't afford to buy a brand new mask. And the mask might cost $50,000. We can sell them one for five. So yeah. it's the same with the sales. So, you know, what are we repurposing? Everything. And what, why is it good? Because we're stopping it from going in the landfill because every day we've got guys around saying, we're going to cut this mast up and chuck it in the dumpster. We're going to burn these sails. And we're like, whoa, 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 we can repurpose that. So it goes to many tiers. If you go to the very bottom tier, the sails, you know, we rate the sails from one to 10, pretty simple. But the ones aren't good enough to go sailing with. But we, we have a, quite a list of people that are artists, people with restaurant chains, people that know, know us now. And they, and they use this equipment for ground sheets, car covers, paint tents, all kinds of repurposing which is great because obviously it's keeping it out of the ground and then you go to the next tier of sales which are people who are using used sales that might have half their life left and they're getting very good value for their dollar they're very happy we have a lot of stuff uh, fund retirees a lot of people with boats that they own at a 40 foot they should really have a 30 footer but they have a 40 footer so they can't really afford their gear so we end up doing a lot of sales with those guys so that works well and at the top end of town we have guys with race boats that by used racing sales, they only have a few hours on them. So there's all these different tranches through the through the rating bands, and it's the same with the spars, and now we've done a safety gear exchange, we've got life rafts, we've got about, I don't know, three dozen rafts that we lease out, they go out with a credit card on, online. So again, being a myself being a boat owner and working for boat owners and understanding how boat owners think, um, we can actually supply equipment that they require at the right price, the right value, because they don't need the life raft for the whole year. They might use it for once a year. So it's, it's a fossil economy only one. So that's why we do the rafts. Again, that's all online. So yeah, that's what we're up to. So it really is just expanding into every kind of area where things can be sold on down the chain. Well, this to me would seem like it's providing the ultra, ultimate entry level for people into sailing because you can then make it an affordable sport and then people can move up those tiers as they progress and as their income maybe grows. Yeah, that sort of hits a, a raw point with me because I'm a big, uh, we have a mantra on our boat, we call it blue collar yachting. <laughs> we like to have people, you know, we want to actually race with blue singlets because we want to have more people that are workers sailing than, than very wealthy people. And the sport should have more people sailing. Like today, as an example, my kid sails an optimist like most kids in most countries and we have about 50 optimists I think we should have about 500. So I think, you know, as Australia being a sailing nation, I don't think we're doing that great a job, to be honest. I think we do a lot better job. And, and your point, which is extremely valid, which why I get it, you know, I'm quite emotional about this, is that we want people coming at entry level to go sailing because they're the people that are going to use other equipment. And the marine industry needs to look after those people. And what we're doing is providing them with, you know, with equipment they can afford to get out in the water and enjoy whether you want to call it a sport or a pastime or a leisure activity, whatever you want to call yachting. I wouldn't call it yacht, yachting, I'd call it sailing with a boat. Yeah. We can provide that equipment to people and I feel very passionate about that and I like to see more people sailing. So I think it is a good thing and I like to work with people that aren't super wealthy that want to go sailing. We've got a great clientele now. After five years of work, we've got the, our repeat customers. I don't know the st exact stats today, but I can tell you they're, they're, they're giving us a lot of traffic. And right now with this whole situation, they've got, we've got more traffic. 
and we are providing equipment. We've got people come back five, six, seven, eight, a dozen times to buy equipment because they get looked after, they get good value, and they come back. So that if you're running a business, that's what everybody wants when they're running a business. So we're, we're quite content with that, and we, and we do a good job of it. I couldn't agree more about the whole participation side. As you know, it's a passion of mine, and I believe that we should be doing far more to help out people coming into sailing. Yeah. Yes, exactly that as a pastime, a recreation, a sport, whatever they want it, we should make it far more accessible. And what you're doing would seem to yeah. help in that respect. Mark, we're on the same page here. I didn't have this plan with you, but I'll get in trouble if I tell you what I really think. But what I, what I, what I do know is sailing is administered by sailing clubs. And that doesn't always work for everybody. The US has, does a good job with community sailing centers, which are places where you can go sailing without being a yacht club member. So I think we're making it hard for ourselves. And I don't want to go into the whole world sailing thing at the moment and all the other issues above club level and admin and national level. I'll stay out of conversation for now. What I think we could be doing a better job of is community sailing without yacht clubs and my kid sails at sailing clubs and i'm not really happy about all the alcohol and i'm not really happy as you get up as you're a parent you get old and you realize how it looks and i would like to see all of ben's school friends sailing but they don't they do other sports and so that pains me so i've invited all of them sailing with ben I, he's got he's got a flying hand he's got he's got lots of boats but the point is I want to get more kids and family sailing. We, we, try, we try and do that. And that's how it used to be when I was a kid. You went sailing because your friends went sailing. You, weren't, you didn't go join the sailing club to go learn how to sail. You, you actually went sailing. The yacht club would run the race. So you went there with other parents and parents had friends and they would invite other people. So that's how the, that, this is the network before the internet and before fax machines and before all that jazz. You know, that's how, just how it was. And I still sort of live in that sort of world and I just try and help people that want to get involved with sailing. And that's what most people do. They're involved with a, a, a group of grassroots. So what I'd like to see more of is local council, local government, people looking at sailing as a, as a healthy activity. But unfortunately it's, as we both know, and probably most people watching this will know that sailing is governed as a, it really is a rich person sport. And, and the people that we deal with, I can tell you, they're not rich people. They're people that want to go sailing, they enjoy sailing, and they want their families to go sailing. And I think that's a very healthy, uh, you know, pastime. Things are going around full circle at the moment. In the UK, we've been running together with the RYA webinars on participation and actually making the sport more accessible. And things are changing. So when we put this up online, I'm going to put a link to those webinars so people can read them and or watch them and take a look. Going back to Sale Exchange now, with um, all the deals that you've done, all of the ways that you've introduced people to sailing, what would you regard as your bi biggest success? And I'm not meaning by this the biggest deal, maybe the biggest set of sales, but the biggest success you've had with Sale Exchange with a client. I, I think the biggest success, you sort of caught me a little bit, but I think the biggest success, as I said before, is building something from scratch and making it successful when really my wife and I started just really not knowing how it was going to end out or end up, you know, and we've been quite fortunate that way. And I think what we've also, what also made successful is it's actually doing quite well. And we've, we've only just really just started. There's a lot more to do. So talking about success is, is always limited because there's always tomorrow, next week and next year. Uh, as we all say, you're only as good as your last race. So, what I see as success is where we've got ourselves to now. What I'm looking forward to is where we're heading in the future. Mm -hmm. And we have teamed up again with a, a very interesting guy called Adrian separate with Marine Auctions. And we're going to yeah. the auction business. And this is a whole nother league to moving equipment. And as you know, and I know, there's a lot of boats sitting around the world that are going to get sold because we're building more boats and we're getting rid of as We all know about the recycling. We all know about end of life i've got another company called boat exchange we've looked for five and a half years into recycling boats we've worked with the french we've worked with the swedes we've actually had those conversations we work with two companies in the us and boat recycling i've been through a lot of this and 
it's hard to make that work economically without government support, which is unfortunate. What I have learned is that we are recycling all the bits on the boat before it gets crushed. We are getting all the parts off the boat, whether it's deck hardware, rigs, fuel tanks. There's a lot to be done there. It's a bit like step plow and sun. You've got a boat yard and you still got to pull everything apart. But the marine options part is interesting because the boats that don't get recycled, that still have a life, as we well know, all these GRP fiberglass boats last for ever. Yeah. And we've been all built since the Second World War and there's more coming every day and there's more being imported every day on ships into Australia. And there's nowhere to get rid of them. So the value, it's hard to get the value right because people, you know, emotionally you own a boat, you think, well, my boat's worth X, but it's actually worth what the market's going to pay for it. So the auction business, I find very interesting. We've done a lot of work on it, comparing it to retail, uh, to sales with uh, automobiles, wine, houses, horses. All these things are auctioned. They're not, they don't put them on a shingle on a door or a window and say, this horse is $20,000 or 100. They go to auction. The reason why they go to auction is that it's the fairest way of doing it. They get the best price for the vendor and the best price for the buyer. So we're working now with people in our industry that are yacht brokers. And we're building another site that we're going to be able to push inventory across that they have that's, let's say it's 300 days or 400 days old, that they can push across to auction and we have that service to find a buyer for that boat. It might be a mast, it might be, we, we, we actually did one in January, we did our first trial, it was moderately successful. We auctioned uh, a spars auction, we had about 20, 20, 25 rigs odd. We sold quite a few of them, more than half at auction. That was good for the people that owned them. Uh, and now we're doing a sale auction with a hundred of our biggest sales, which we're gearing for Europe for June, for, the, for your summer. Hopefully we'll go sailing by then, I'm not really sure. But the auction process will be, we have sales from, I'll give you an example, Wild Oats, Comanche, uh, Loyal, you know, I, I don't know, I've probably got about 60, 100 foot yacht sales, some are virtually new. A mainstream on Wild Oats, to put this so everyone watching this understands, the mainstream costs a quarter of a million dollars and it's sitting in a shed. Now, when they ask me what I'm going to sell it for, I'm going to sell myself for the highest price I can get for it because yeah. I'm going to give the person that owns that sale half that money. That's a pretty good deal for them because otherwise it's going to sit where it is forever. So we're going to do this auction process with what we have today and we're going to go further into the auction process with boats and power boats and equipment and floor plans and people with outboard floor plans, I can't sell inventory. So this stuff has to go somewhere. And so that's our next avenue in our business. So when you talk about success, I don't think we're really successful. I think we've done okay. But I think there's a lot more on the horizon that I'm looking forward to because I believe there's a better way of doing it than it's been done today. And it's quite clear that you've always believed in these partnerships and just looking at the comparisons to what is done, what is done elsewhere, as in housing, horses, as you talked about, and just taking a look at different models and changing what has been done. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it, no, it provides no, no. a different avenue. Um, one thing that I can say about Sale Exchange and a lot of what you have just talked about is this must actually be a hugely environmentally friendly business. You're, you're completely online and what you're actually doing is recycling as many products as you possibly can from sailing. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. No doubt about that. And it, the thing is, it's a never ending supply because the, the, the story I like telling is that always with a, a boat owner who wants to do some moderate amount of harbour racing or club racing, you know, his garage would be full of sails. And every morning that wife walks in to get the car and the sails and she, and he, she says, can you get rid of these sails? And he goes, no, I can't. And he says, well, why are they sitting here? You don't ever use them, so I can't throw them out. I can't. We've got nowhere to put, this, to put the sails to start with. And the wife says she wants to buy a couch. She goes, well, we can't afford that. We've got these sails. So now sail exchange, we can get rid of these sails out of their garage and, the, and she can buy a couch. So that's the analogy I use. So, you know, th there are sails everywhere. And equipment everywhere because there are there is no outlet. That's what we, we've already discussed. That's why we started the company. Um, but it's not stopping with sales. I mean, there's a, we you know we've, we've sold winch pedestals, bow prodders, um, winches, electric winches, hydraulic winches, hydraulic systems, all kinds of you know mostly upmarket up up end racing equipment. We don't sell ships, bells, and clocks and that sort of jazz. We let it to other people. 
the racing equipment, the yachting equipment, we have more coming in than going out and we need to do a better job of selling it. And that's why we're gonna go in the auction business so we can move more product. And uh, we're gonna have that in June, so you'll know all about that because it'll end up on your uh, on sale world, so you'll be the first to know. <laughs> Brilliant. Now, talking of partnerships, the entire way through Sale Exchange, it's been you and Bettina working together. And that must be an incredible partnership to you are husband and wife, yet working together. Um, how important has she been to the business? Yeah, well, she actually knows how it works. That's a really good thing, because I don't. So, but like all husband and wife terms, you have your moments, and you know, there's, good, there's upsides and downsides. But the thing with Bettina is she's quite analytical, and she's, she's running all the back end of the system. So we've got four websites, we've got CRM, and everything's linked and backlinked. So that is sort of out of my league. Um, I try to, be in there, but um, she runs all the accounts, all the billings, the whole box and die. So, you know, I'll take my hat off to her because I, I mean, it's way out of my league. Um, but like all husband wife teams, you know, you've got the, you know, you, you, someone has to sell the stuff and someone's got to actually organize it. So Bettina organized it and she, she's Dutch and my father was Swedish. So there's a lot of organizational skills in there and DNA. So I, I don't think it would, would work without her. And you've got to, in this business, you, you know, like all modern businesses, it's all about reducing overhead. So, you know, we have a factory that we, we use and we have, a you know, all the inventory in there. But the good thing about it, as I said before, is inventory keeps coming in. We're not paying for that inventory. That's a, that's a bonus. So if I was to value the inventory, we're, you know, we're up around two, two, two million dollars of inventory that has been, you know, basically consigned. And we've got more coming in. So I'm looking forward to, uh, doing these auctions, as I said, and getting some space in the place, but I can tell you it's pretty full right now to the, from the floor to the ceiling, the nine meter clearance with the scissor lift, there's, there's a lot of sales in there. Yeah. Now with all this going on and the constant expansion and changes and additions and partnerships you're putting in with the business, how do you get time for your own sailing? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's a good question. I, you know, everyone in the marine industry sails, that's, that's a given. So every sail maker sails, most riggers sail, because that's how you know your craft. Eventually, you know, you need to know what you're talking about if you're going to stay in this business. You can't not sail. I've been very fortunate. I've got a, a lifelong partner, Tim Hawkins, uh, who lives in the US. We've met each other in the early 80s sailing maxi boats, and we're partners in this sail exchange, Cooks and 12, which we race. We've been pretty successful. We've done five ocean races. We've placed in our division every race and Hobart and Southport and Glass and all sort of jazz. So we use that as our recreation. But look, you know, as we both know, it's a marketing tool. We, it's a marketing platform. We uh, talk to customers on there. We show customers how things work. We explain to people how to set up furling gear. We explain them how to set up sales properly. We show them, you know, things that are, uh, that are intuitive to you and I, that is sort of foreign to them. And it gives us a platform to explain why we do things a certain way because people coming into the sport as we talked about earlier they it's like me going to try and play tennis like i don't know anything about it right? they come in as, yachting is a very complicated industry it's a complicated sport so whatever we can do to help people is a bonus and you've got to take all the all the you know slang out of it because people don't understand what you're talking about to start with. So if you can show them, we do it a lot out of the boat. So the boat's use almost, in fact, every weekend we race the boat. We have people come into the boat to either pick up sails, we'll take them to the CYC or Mill Harbour, where we are in the world. And then we also show them the boat, take them through the boat, we show them how we prepare the boat for Hobart. We show them all our tricks that we've done downstairs in the boat to sail the boat competitively. We show them how we organise things on the deck, we replace every piece of equipment on the deck. Um, so I like sharing that knowledge and, sh and helping people so they understand why or more, how you make a boat competitive. Well, because we bought the boat three years ago, we, since then we've replaced everything, and the boat's full sack from sea, full deck gear, o offshore, everything. You get, get in that thing right now and go in the world and it'll be fine. Uh, we've had the job list from hell, like every boat owner, like you end up with a six page, you know, we got it down to half a page, now we're down to about three, which is pretty good. So we've done all those hard work, all that hard work with a crew, with a great bunch of guys that sail with us, a lot of friends I've grown up with. 
so it's a lot of fun. So the point is, yeah, we do sail, we do find time to go sail because she's always done on holiday, right? Like the Hobart's done on Boxing Day. I think mean, you know the story about Ealing work, how that happened. It was after Christmas to get away from the family. That's what Hobart race is about. Uh, Gladstone races on Easter, that's pretty family friendly as well. So, you know, what, what, is, what happens is all these events are around holidays. So um, we, uh, we do get some downtime. And because the boat uh, has a computer, we have SATCOM C, we've got internet so we can run the business wherever we are. So that's pretty handy as well. So that all works hand in hand and, you know, we're pretty fortunate that way. Even with this COVID thing, I've got to say it's, you know, the, the world's a strange place right now. Everyone's got their stories and, you know, I, I get all that. But what has been interesting to me is we actually really haven't changed the way we run our business at all. In fact, all we've done is found more time to do more work and especially digital work. So we're working with CRMs and Facebook for business and we've got so much going on in the digital world and upgrading the site and Shopify. We've got so much going on that the day is more full than it was before. And we've still got the same amount of traffic because, or more traffic because everyone's at home on the Googling it and looking at sales. So the inquiry rates up, the sales are up and we're working as we would do normally. So we've been very lucky that way. That wasn't, let me tell you, that wasn't by design. That wasn't because I'm smart. There's a lot of smarter people than me out there in the world than me, but we've been very fortunate and it's worked really well. So, um, you know, we're pretty happy with the way things are and I know they're going to improve, but right now uh, we're uh, making hay while we can. Well, that's a very familiar story um, with, on the website, Yes, we, we've got a huge amount of extra traffic coming in because people are about, even though there is no traditional event reporting going on. But I think, again, it comes down to that thing where, as an entrepreneur, as someone who starts their own business, you've got that agility for it. But what was interesting there is when you talked about your sailing, is you are now hopping on the boats, going on, making sure, doing those checklists. Going full circle on this interview, you have turned into the mentor for the new sailors in the yachting industry, Carl. It's a jobless boat, like hundreds of jobless, and they're all the same on every boat. Everyone boats, they've all got the same problems, they're all racing boats. But um, yeah, no, definitely. And you know, with the digital thing's interesting as well, because we, you know, with Sedgeway, we talked about options, we talked about sail exchange, spar exchange, safety exchange. We're, also working with Marina Exchange, which you know about because we work with you in the power boat world on that. And we have just started today revamping the app and revamping the site again to have another go at getting boat owners to actually step up to technology. This is questionable. This might happen, it might not happen. But we want people to <laughs> book Marina Bursts online. Imagine that. Um, you know, like you book a hotel room. I've got to tell you a good story. When we went to all the marinas in Australia, went on the full tour, you know, every marina, hundreds of them and they all said ah oh, it's a bit complicated i'm not really sure we can do this no, I don't know. and i remember going to newcastle yacht club and uh i was in this meeting and this guy said did you sail in the caribbean in 1980 something or other i said yeah yeah he said i sailed with you i said oh, yeah. and he said uh, i was in a meeting uh very similar to this about 20 years ago and i said tell me about that and he said well we had a guy come into a hotel his name was graham wood he owned a TP at the time. He had a boat called What's Next or What, what You Are. Anyway, the company was called uh, What If, and it was the first Australian online hotel booking site since it's been bought by Expedia and Travago and gone gang buses. But the story is that this guy was a junior in the, in the hotel industry, and he was sitting in a meeting as a junior, and Graham Wood came in and said, Look, I've been you know, talking to you guys for weeks and months, trying to, we just want to get one hotel room to put on our website because we're going to sell hotel rooms on the website. And the manager of the hotel, I won't say the name, but said, why would we put a hotel room on a website? We've already got a building here. People come in with a credit card. They book the room. We give them a key. They go upstairs. Why, why, why would we put it on a website? So that's not going to work. That was 20 years ago. Right? That's what if, that's Graham Wood. He's a smart guy. Lovely guy, by the way, great sailor too. But we're trying to do that in the marine industry right now. And I'm telling you, it's hard work. It's hard, hard work. Because if people book an aeroplane flight or they book a hotel room, let me tell them they're going to book a marina berth that's just so foreign. It's like, you, it's, you know, can't be done. So that's our next big challenge, Mark. I'll be working with you on that just so you, you give us a heads up. 
for Maria Exchange, which will be on Sale World, uh, that we want to get people to download the app. We've been through that, it's taken five years, that hasn't worked. So now we're going to a mobile friendly device so people can just Google it and book a Marina bird. And uh, that's starting to work. So that's the next big thing with the exchange group. So there's a bit more going on there. Well, there it's an exciting, exciting future ahead. A lot of education to be done for the new boat owners, for people stepping up, but also the industry itself. And you are one of these people who is driving the industry forward. So, Carl, many thanks indeed for your time. Stay safe in these crazy times. And um, all the best as the business expands. Thank you much. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for your time. And I've really enjoyed it. And hopefully we'll get to talk to you again soon. Looking Thank forward to much. it, Carl. Take care. Okay.